Say, uh, Jerry, how did you and Dean get together originally? We started in Atlantic City six years ago. I was doing a single, and they wanted another act, and I recommended Dean because he was my pal, and he was a big hit, and we wound up doing a double. We still don't know how it worked, but we're on radio this fall for Chesterfield again, and we're doing a big show. Do you ever have any trouble with the other members of the cast? Oh, we fool around a lot, but nothing I can put my finger on. Say, uh, Jerry, all of us out here saw you on the Bob Hope Bing Crosby uh, Olympic Marathon. Was that a lot of work? There was no work. We both went on cold. We didn't plan on being on the show until the day of the show. There was no rehearsing. We went on cold and did whatever we felt like. You mean you did that whole thing without a script, then? The whole thing was ad lib. You know, it looked at one time as though you were about to pull off Crosby's toupee. Is that right? If he stood there, I'd have pulled it off. <laughs> you know, uh, we know that uh, all of those little uh, sketches that you use and those little odd bits aren't written. What's your secret for being able to throw in all of that spontaneous humor? Well, uh, we don't know. We just thank the good Lord that he gave us the ability to uh, be able to uh, throw in all that stuff. Because well, you certainly do a stuff. miraculous job of it. Well, thank you very much, Dean. We've certainly enjoyed having you with us. It's the Martin and Lewis Show. The National Broadcasting Company brings you transcribed the new Martin and Lewis show. Our guest tonight, Bob Hope. And featuring Flo McMichael, Mike Roy, the Martin Gales, Dick Stabile and his orchestra, and starring Dean Martin. What a day this has been. What a rare mood I'm in. And Jerry Lewis. I'm the singer on the show, and you're the comedian. Remember that? Then, uh, so stay in your place, will you? What do you want to stop pushing me around for? The show is all even started, and already you're trying to be the big man. Go ahead, kick me. Step on me. Wipe your feet on me. You're always poking fun at me. Oh, Jerry, stop. I don't poke any fun at you. Think of all the times I've defended you. You've defended me? Of course, many times. You're so ungrateful. Ungrateful? What did you ever do for me? Give me a for instance. I'll gratitude you. <laughs> I found out tonight that 70-30 isn't an even split. <laughs> now, let's get back to that 60-40. What do you say? <laughs> okay, sure, Jerry. Whatever you say, pal. If you want 60-40, you get it. Now, is it all right if I go ahead and sing a song? You don't mind to give me the 60-40? No, it's all it's right. It's like this, you said, and... It's easy. Not even a word. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, sing three, four notes. <laughs> Pack up all my cares and woes Here I go while I'm singing low Bye, bye, blackbird As part of NBC's programming development, $1.5 million was allocated towards new shows. The network's first major signing was Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. In August of 1948, they made their Hollywood debut at Slapsy Maxie's. They were soon guest starring on Milton Berle's TV show, and other comedians thought their elegant appearance groundbreaking. On December 22nd, the duo recorded an audition with Bob Hope. Hope recorded a new set with Martin and Lewis on March 24th, 1949. Things quickly fell apart as the trio couldn't help but ad-lib. Playing. They shouldn't do that. Well, why not, Jerry? Sounds like the Bob Hope Show. Hey, Dick, Stabile, hold it. This is the Martin and Lewis Show starring those two sensational partners. Bob Hope <laughs> and Swan Soup. Thank you. Yes, sir, those two sensational partners. Bob Hope and Swan Soap, the famous floater and the famous sinker. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here tonight to perform a very pleasant task. As you must know by now, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis are two young and very talented fellas whom NBC has adopted. I'm sure they'll bring you many hours of top entertainment. I'm sincerely honored to be here and welcome to the network the handsome, talented, gorgeous voice, Dean Martin. Well, thanks, Bob, for all the wonderful compliments. And his partner, Jerry Lewis. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> ah, now, thanks, Bob, for... Uh, I don't get no compliments. <laughs> oh. Jerry, is that any way to talk to Bob after he comes all the way down here to wish us luck? I think it's very swell of him. Oh, it's nothing. I didn't have anything else to do this evening. It's the maid's night off. <laughs> But I know how it is when you're starting a new show. It seems like only yesterday that I was worrying about my radio program. In fact, it was only yesterday. <laughs> well, we, we really appreciate this, Bob. We, we figured we need plenty of help to succeed in Hollywood. Oh, I'm sure you're going to be very successful, Dean. Well, uh, how about Jerry? Yeah, how about that? <laughs> oh, come on, Mr. Hope. Stop making with the jokes like that. You promised you'd make us seem funny. Well, don't worry about it, Jerry. No comedian's ever gonna top that top of years. <laughs> Tell me, who does your hair? Are you bangy? <laughs> Nobody does it. I just get out of bed, and if I can't see anything, I know my hair is cold. <laughs> well, Jerry can't help the way his hair looks, Bob. You see, when his parents found him on the doorstep, they threw him away and raised a fuller brush sample. <laughs> Well, that's hair, huh? He, he looks like the boy with a green Brillo. <laughs> What's the matter with my hair? It's hair, ain't it? Are you asking or telling? I'm wondering. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with it, and it's just that you look like you're standing with your back to a high wind. It just grows that way. And I'm not standing with my back to any high wind. On the contrary. <laughs> Look, Bebop. <laughs> Were you born or did your mother miss a question on truth or consequences? <laughs> wrong with it if I happen to like my hair rather short? Rather short? What does the barber use, scissors or sandpaper? Oh, <laughs> uh, the barber uses scissors, but he works from the inside. <laughs> A lot of time. And, he, and he sings, too, you know. Can I go now? Yeah, anytime. <laughs> That's all we can get with that. Go, it's all right. <laughs> Well, it just so happens I have to keep my ass short, Mr. Hope. Every time I let it get any longer than this, my knees buckle. <laughs> well, it didn't you... pay. <laughs> Can I go now? <laughs> well, I want to tell you, you boys are going to be working pretty hard from now on, so, Jerry, you've got to build up your strength. What do you suggest, Mr. Hope? Put something in your pot, boy. <laughs> Oh, Jerry will fill out when he gets a little older, Bob. You know, he's not as old as some comedians. <laughs> Got another high wind here. <laughs> Don't look at me when you say that, you West Point victim -one. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at a man of 31, you know. <laughs> no laugh? <laughs> 31. 31. 31. <laughs> he keeps doing it till he gets a good reading. <laughs> Wait a minute, Mr. Hope. I saw your birth certificate and you're not 31. Jerry? Don't try to stop me, Dean. The birth certificate said born in 1910 and this is 1949. You're not 31, you're 35. <laughs> Thank you, Joel Kupperman. <laughs> Nice counting. Did you hire an income tax man this year, or are you leaving us soon? Well, you see how young he is, Bob? It was embarrassing when we were working in nightclubs. It was embarrassing? Yes, after we finished our act, Jerry would step up to the bar and order three fingers of Mead's formula with a pablum chaser. <laughs> I know, the other night he was on my show, after every joke he told, I had to throw him over my shoulder and burp him. <laughs> Now 
listen, you two. <laughs> it's all right for you to stand there and vituperate my adolescence. But I will have you know that Gerald Lewis is capable of exuding as much sophistry as anyone else. <laughs> Jerry. Yes? Your safety pin is unfastened again. <laughs> yeah, and you can see the inside of your head. <laughs> just jealous because when I go over to Paramount, Jane Russell holds me on her knee. What do you think she holds me? <laughs> Off? <laughs> you peaked. <laughs> you know, Bob, we envy you making pictures with all the big stars. Did you have a hard time getting started in the show business? Hard, Dean? Yeah. You know, one time in New York, I lived for six months on nothing but donuts. Every time I'd ask an agent for a job, I'd get so nervous, I'd break out in powdered sugar. <laughs> Fortunately, I had a partner who broke out in cold coffee. Really, really, Bob, we'll always remember one thing, though. You were so wonderful to us when we first came to Paramount, when we were poor and hungry. Why, we couldn't even afford to split one of those 50-cent box lunches. Oh, it was nothing. Nothing? You call it nothing, making us a special one for a quarter? <laughs> Well, I came out all right. I just used less swan soap in the salad. <laughs> hey, you boys are making a movie now. How do you like acting, Jerry? Oh, it's great, Bob. What scenes I have, what lines I deliver, what emotion I portray. Why, one saying I say, one saying, saying... <laughs> <laughs> Start over, it's tape. <laughs> Crosby starts 10 times a night. Go ahead. I better hurry. We'll be here till Christmas. All right. Why, yes. <laughs> now, really, in one scene, I say to the girl, Bob, I say, the world may think of me as a nobody, but Gwendolyn, in your arms, I'm a bird soaring up in the blue. I'm a flower pushing up my head through the soil. I'm a moth floating helplessly into your burning flame. Boy, that's a moting, isn't it? How do you like that, Bob? Hello, Mort. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, tell me one thing. What's that? Are you for real? <laughs> Wait a minute, Mr. Hope. That's my line. I don't care if you are Bob Hope. No comedian's supposed to steal another comedian's lines. Okay, runt. What are you going to do about it? Hello, Mort. <laughs> <laughs> Say, Bob, we saw you in a picture. No kidding. With Dorothy the Mortier tonight, it must be exciting working with her. Oh, it's nothing, really. My Adam's apple ought to stop jumping any day now. <laughs> How about that scene where Dorothy was dancing the hula? She started out slowly, but when she shifted into second, wow. Wow. You should, you should have seen the part they cut out She was in overdrive You know, I bet that film is still flopping around on the cutting room floor yeah, I they, get the good one yeah. I had one that I thought was pretty good, but you ruined it right now. <laughs> Would you mind trying your line once again? All right. You know, I bet the film is still flopping around on the cutting room floor. Yeah, only last week they finally beat it to death with a stick. <laughs> Thank you very much. Say, by the way, fellas, I'm throwing a little reception for you guys tonight after your show. Oh, a reception for us? You hear that, Jerry? Yeah, can you get some girls, or is this too sudden? We'll be... <laughs> oh, step all of us, nothing at all. <laughs> just, you just a little me. <laughs> Yeah, what? Would you mind... <laughs> You're not exactly Saratan to me, you know. <laughs> well, will you please read Lampshade Head? <laughs> You can cut that line out, too, I guess, too, huh? Yes! Oh, my... We'll be there, Bob. The kind of girls we know, nothing's too sudden. <laughs> Bye! Wait a minute.
it, I'll get my hat and go with you. And another thing... <laughs> and another thing, fellas, it's going to be a formal party. It's formal? Yeah, bring your own pool cue. <laughs> it's really going to be a swell affair. Sounds good, Bob. Are you going to have champagne? I get a straight line. <laughs> <can't even> <laughs> Funny how those strange words came out all right, you know? I don't want you guys to get upset, but I don't like how well you're working together. <laughs> don't worry, I can never match that hair. I'm having trouble growing it back here now. <laughs> Would you mind uh, feeding me again, if you don't mind? Sounds good, Bob. Are you going to serve champagne? No, I couldn't get any champagne, so I'm serving 7-Up and Coke. Nobody will know the difference. <laughs> Wait a minute, Bob. No one would take 7-Up and uh, Coke in preference to champagne? I would, but I'm only 23 years old. What do I know? <laughs> this kid's really going to live tonight. At midnight, he'd be drinking Ovaltine from Margaret O'Brien's slipper. <laughs> well, it's awfully nice of you, Bob, to invite us. I'm sorry. Please. <laughs> I hope you folks are enjoying our career. <laughs> NBC picked up the series, marketing the team as the next big sensation in radio. Their agent, Abby Greshler, negotiated a great deal with Paramount's Hal Wallace. The duo would receive $75,000 for films and were free to do one outside film a year, which they would co-produce through their own York Productions. They also had complete control over their club, radio, and TV appearances, as well as their recording contracts. You've got me confused. You've read every line on this page. <laughs> and, and, and after looking it over, you can have them. Now try this one. May I, may I, ask, may I ask a question? I didn't get your I name. Say, <laughs> Why not? Why not? I'm helping to kill you, too. You might as well. Step in, Jerry. Step in. And Jerry Colon. Yeah. Listen, uh, I just... <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to tell you, fellas, that the, the, man, the man in the control room is laughing, but he's burning. <laughs> We're very lucky if he's still with us, isn't he? In the lead-up to the premiere of their radio show, Martin and Lewis appeared on the March of Dimes, the Chesterfield Supper Club, the Seal Test Variety Theater, and the Bob Hope Show. The Martin and Lewis Show finally debuted on April 3, 1949. Their first guest was Lucille Ball. It had a similar script to the audition recorded with Bob Hope. And now I would like to present one of Hollywood's most glamorous stars, currently gracing your neighborhood screens in Sorrowful Jones, a charming actress who gracefully combines the talents of a leading lady and comedian. Now listen here, Dean Martin. Don't you say anything nice about me, you big bully, you, you monster. I'll have you know well, that I'm Wait I a minute, the... wait a minute. Why, you are Lucille Ball. <laughs> But, but what's the matter, Lucille? Don't act like you don't know. You've got some nerve, Dean Martin, asking me to come down here and be a guest on your radio program after the way you beat up that sweet, adorable little Jerry Lewis. Why, uh, if I weren't a perfect lady, I'd slug you. The idea, beating up that darling, cute, lammy pie. Me? <laughs> yes, you, Dean Martin. <laughs> Well, Jerry, hey, hey, where'd he go? He's behind me where he'll be safe. He's not going to stay out here where you can knock him down again. Knock him down? Yes, and kicking him and throwing dirt in his face and trying to drive your car over him. I did that? See, Lucille, he admits it. Oh, I get it. Jerry told you that story. Yes, he did. I never met anyone so contemptible as you in my whole life. How could you treat Jerry that way? He's so darling and so cute. You forgot Lammy Pie. <laughs> Just exactly what did Jerry tell you I did to him? He told me the whole story. It's incredible to me that you could pick on a little fella like that when you have such a grand physique. Uh, I mean, when, when you're so much bigger than he is, with all those great, big, powerful muscles. <laughs> you 
You big... Yes? And, and the things you called him. It's just hard to imagine names like that being spoken by you. Why, you have that wonderful, soft, caressing voice. Yes? Lucille, hey, Lucille! <laughs> Will you stop tugging at my skirt? I just wanted you to know I'm still here. Lewis is the name. Jerry Lewis, they call me. Don't stop, Lucille. Tell them off. Good. All right. <laughs> You're right. Dean Martin, how could you have slugged poor Jerry when you look so... so handsome with those soft eyes and long, long lashes? Yes? Hey, Lucille! Shut up, you little schnook. <laughs> Me, schnook! The idea of telling those awful fibs about this darling, cute, lammy pie, Dean Martin. I ought to turn you over my knee and spank you. Ding, ding! Yes? <laughs> ding, are you gonna stand there and let her talk to me like that? Yes? Ah, <laughs> uh, but really, he isn't bad at all, Lucille. In fact, he's a very nice guy. In fact, he's a wonderful guy. Why, Jerry is the important half of our act. He's the talent. Why, he's the one who gets all the laughs. He's the one the critics rave about. He's the one the people love. Oh, what a ham. <laughs> well, uh, it's sure nice of you to come down tonight and help us get, on our, get, get our first show started, Lucille. I figured we need plenty of advice, advice here in Hollywood. Come on, snap out of it. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to be very successful Well, how about Jerry? Yeah, how about that? <laughs> You'll see, I'm going to be a big star When I make my first picture, I'll be sensational I'll be... Well, you do think I'll be a picture star, don't you, Lucille? Why not? Lassie made it <laughs> If you're going to make fun of me, I'll quit the show I'll give... I'll give... I'll give... <laughs> I'll give Dean all the money we've saved, and I'll go home and lock myself in a closet, kick my heels, and hold my breath until I die. And if you want to know why I do these things, it's because, listen. <laughs> well, don't get too desperate, Jerry. Look, I, I have planned a little party for you and Dean after the show. Uh, lots of important people will be there. Well, that's wonderful, Lucille. Well, the only thing, Dean, uh, does Jerry know how to act at a party? Do I know how to act at a party? Why, one time in the back room of a barbershop... Jerry! <laughs> Hold it. You see what I mean? Miss Ball. <laughs> Miss Ball, Mr. Martin. I would like to inform you that Gerald Lewis, when attempting a social event... Attending a social event... <laughs> Paper, what do you want? <laughs> Miss Ball and Mr. Martin, when I, I'd like to inform you that Gerald Lewis, when attending a social event, always conducts himself with complacent, elegant simplicity, utterly devoid of ostentation. <laughs> but the Martin and Lewis show was a flop. No sponsor was interested in advertising such a visual team on a sound only medium. They switched broadcasting locations from Hollywood to New York and back to Hollywood. They also brought in new writers and characters. Nothing worked. And I like him to be of my intelligence. Sorry, Margaret O'Brien can't stay out that late. Well, what are your plans after you finish the movie you're in now? Well, first we're going down to the Dallas Fair around September and do it uh, for 16 days down there. Then we're coming back and do a picture around December, our own picture, probably called The Caddy. You know, it's a golf story. I can hear a lot of background noises. Where are you and Jerry speaking from now? Your dressing room? Yes, we're right now in our dressing room. What's the name of the movie you're working on now? Well, there's a little thing called Scared Stiff. It's about, well, uh, a few gangsters, and I think that I have shot someone, but I haven't. Then uh, we're going on an island, going to a haunted house, and uh, we have a couple of zombies, and they scare the hell out of us. How do you guys get along with your writers? Well, they're drunk all the time. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> 
Do you use the same writers for your movies as you do for television and radio? They're all right. Yeah, we have our own writers on this script. It's a very good thing for both Jerry and I. We're always together in every scene, and we do a lot of, you know, all that crazy stuff. What? Well, he did stumble his way through high school. He looks more like he had to shoot his way out of kindergarten. <laughs> NBC pulled the plug after the September 6th broadcast. Well, uh, my house isn't one of those elaborate Hollywood mansions.